I'll be reading Acts chapter 20, verses 32 through 35. Acts 20, 32 through 35. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me in all things. I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak, and remember the words of our Lord Jesus. How he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Blessed is the reading of God's holy word of grace to us through the mouth of God himself in true humanity, our Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, a holy Father, may we this morning joyfully revel in this word of grace. And therefore allow this passage to speak to each and every one of our hearts of the beauty of your grace and the beauty of being sanctified in your eternal Son conformed to his image. Do it, Lord, to the glory of your name. Amen and amen. There are two particular, there are many, many wonderful verses in the Bible. I realize because the way I was going to say this, but there are two particular hope-filled verses in the Bible for sinners. For, for selfish sinners like us in this room. The first is Romans 8, 29. Hear the word of the Lord. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that his son Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. That's the first. Oh, how hope-filled that is. God's work. And the second verse is the foundational truth that is found in our passage this morning. It is the reality that reflects the very nature of the Creator Himself. It is the Creator Himself who lived out this verse in human flesh. Verse 35, the words that the creator in human flesh also spoke to those who are his. It is more blessed to give comparatively than it is to receive. We all receive. You got to receive or no one would ever give. But of the two, it's even more 
happy making, joyful to give than to receive. There is no being conformed to the image of God's Son without growing in giving away your money, yourself, your time, and your care for others and to the kingdom of God. When we who have come to Jesus give with the right heart, the joyful heart, we act just like God. The most famous verse in the Bible is clear. For God so loved the world that he did a verb. He gave his only son so that whoever would believe in him will not perish but will have eternal life. Okay, here's the intro. Let's go to the passage. So here we are after numbers of weeks in this one speech of Paul's to the Ephesian elders in this morning. He, he brings his speech to an end. And he ends it with his own personal example of being free from greed and covetousness. And instead he tells them, you know how I did this. I chose to work double time in order to earn enough money to put a roof over my head, clothing on my back, and food on my table. And not just that, but enough to do it for those co-workers with me. The whole three years I was with you in Ephesus, even though I had a right to be supported financially by you in my ministry. Paul, he commits these men to the grace of God. And he tells them, this is his whole point. You know where I got that from? I got it from Jesus, who taught us it's more blessed to give than to receive. And Paul's saying, do I really want to be more fulfilled or less fulfilled? More free or less free? More happy or less happy? And he believed Jesus' words. It is more happy making to give than it is to receive. And so what this passage teaches us today is that the reason that, that giving is more blessed than receiving is first because in the giving it releases us from the constant temptation and sin in our hearts of greed. And secondly, in doing that, the giving is conforming us to the image of Jesus. See, here it is. This is very simple, right? For us Bible Christians, we know Ephesians 2. We're all born into sin. Here's another way to say that. Every single one of us has been born into greed and covetousness. We were all two years old at one time, and it was our nature as we see it in our own children. What? More. More. Give me more. Share that. No. It's mine. 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 That is just living out our nature. And then, and that two-year-old becomes an eight-year-old or an 18-year-old or a 69-year-old, and the gospel comes with the awakening power of the Holy Spirit, and we all come into this extraordinary experience of the gift, the giving, the grace of God 
in Jesus Christ. We become the recipients of the number one great giver in all existence. And then we are called to go on in this passage living by the word of God. That's what it says. Or the way Paul phrases it here to these to these men is go on living by the word of his grace look at verse 32 and now men i i, I commend you because i'm not going to see you anymore you won't see my face this is a b- goodbye and that's why they're going to kiss and hug on the beach or wherever he's preaching this to him I now commend you, put you in the hands of God. Not just that. And to the word of his grace. And now watch what he says about that word of his grace that I'm committing you to. That word is able to build you up. It's able to give you what you really long for if you're a true believer. The future salvation that you look to. It's able to give you the inheritance among all of those who are sanctified. Paul commits them to the grace of God working in them through the word of his grace. In other words, he's telling these guys, go on, go on, feeding upon the word of God's grace. This word's able to build you up. It's able to develop you. It's able to mature you, to grow you up. And ultimately, what you really are looking for, it's able to actually bring you in to the eternal inheritance of the resurrection on that day. All of those who have been set apart out of our darkened sin, Jesus comes and grabs us. That's what sanctified means here. He takes and sets you apart in Himself by the, by the Spirit. All who have been set apart in Christ Every one of them will inherit the kingdom of God by the work of God, of the word of God in them. He means, when he says sanctified in this verse, all of those who have been set apart, and are being set apart, sanctified. The verb form here, the participle, is in the perfect tense, which, which in, we don't have this in English. In Greek, it's specific. Something that has happened previously in the past, but with, from that start, ongoing effects all the way up to the very present moment. He means all who are being sanctified by the word, which means he is mercifully and constantly working and changing our hearts so that we love God. That we move toward sanctification, holiness, by the Word of God working in us. That is, in other words, we move toward loving the words of God. When they confront us or when they comfort us, we move toward the Word. It's our joy. Or or negatively, you see this in Romans 7, the being sanctified is this, this growing hatred for our sin and our greed. And we're on the pursuit of holiness. Like all who are being sanctified. And then Paul, 
He gives a specific, concrete example of the word of grace working in his own sinful life. Pick up in verse 33. I was greedy for not any of your money and gold and silver and clothing. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands, my very hands in blue collar tent making work, ministered to my necessities and to those who worked with me in the ministry. In all things, I, Paul, was doing something. Men, elders, I was modeling for you something. I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help, have money to help the weak. To remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So, in the context, Paul picks out a specific word of grace. And he shows, oh, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And he put himself up as a model to show how the word of grace was sanctifying him by constantly breaking the neck of his greed and covetousness. And what he's doing is therefore commending it to all of these elders before him. Guys, be givers. Help others. And and there's a context. I'll get there in a second for this. Do not exploit them who are under your care. Outgive those under your care. Giving. The actual action of giving is the most powerful weapon against idolatry, against covetousness, against greed. Now let's pause for a moment. Remember the context of this speech and the context of Paul's ministry. He has already mentioned there are many wolves, preachers of the gospel, so-called. Many wolves he warns them about, and even some of you will become Wolves, and what Paul has learned for a couple decades now, and, and you can just read all of his writings. Sit down for one day and read every letter of Paul. Concentrate on them. It's throughout where there are ministers of the gospel in the churches who are in it for financial gain. These calls wolves and those who twist the gospel change it constantly he doesn't just say oh they got it wrong he goes to their motive of covetousness okay now the new testament is clear the apostle paul himself argued in first corinthians 9 and in first timothy 5 that those who work in the gospel preaching, teaching ministry should be supported financially, recompensed for their work by the church. But there is a huge difference between being supported in the gospel ministry and a person who is in the ministry. In order to get rich. And it's all around today. It has it has always been for 2,000 years. All around. In order to take advantage of the sheep. 
That's why one of the requirements laid out in the New Testament for New Testament elders in the list, one of the requirements is they must be not enslaved to the worship of money. They must be free from the love of money. First Timothy. Or the way Paul says it in Titus, they must not be greedy for financial gain. If, if, if shepherds are in it for ulterior motives to fleece the flock, sheep, flock, get the wool, that's what we're in it for, then that person's authority of true spiritual giving out in the ministry is destroyed. And it would model a destructive lifestyle and it would be very very bad for that man. Just as it is very bad for all Christians to live the lifestyle of greed. Greed is a sin that destroys the greedy person. That's why the Bible the New Testament constantly puts greed right up alongside of sexual immorality and idolatry and homosexual activity and drunkenness, etc. In these lists, greed is always right there as if you are not repenting and fighting against these things in your life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus himself clearly said in Mark 7, don't blame the outside what's happening. Our problem is us. That's what Jesus tells us constantly. And if anybody ought to know that in, the Christ, in, in their life, it is us who are Christians in all things. He says, from Within you. From within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, coveting. And wickedness and deceit and sensuality and envy and slander and pride and foolishness. All these evil things come from within. And they defile the person. And Paul wrote it this way in 1 Timothy 6. But if we have food... He doesn't mean if we have $80 steak dinners four times a week. If we have sustenance, we're alive, we're not starving. We have food and we have clothing to wear. He doesn't mean, you know, you have a wardrobe and it's worth $89,000. He means we have food, we have clothing. With these, we'll be content. But, he says... Those who desire, just there it is, just, oh, that's what I really live for, who desire to be rich, they fall into temptation, into a snare like an animal trap, into many, many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin. Destruction. Why, Paul? Well, here's his next line, and this is a very famous line, but this is his line. Paul knows this truth because the worship, that's what he means here by love, because he knows the teachings of the Lord Jesus. You cannot love God and money at the same time and in the same way. 
It's impossible. You can't worship. You can't. You're either looking to God as your satisfaction or to money. For, Paul says, the love of money, when it gets hold, it, it is a root. Not just of money loving, but then spreads to all kinds of evils. And, and this, is, this is what's sad, because Paul's talking about what's happening, and he's seen it in the church. He says, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from Christianity. The faith. And they've pierced themselves with many pains. Their life is filled with emotional or physical or whatever else. Just traumatic. Experiences. God's truth, the word of His grace. Paul is letting us know that is the ongoing key to staying free from the destructive sin of greed. Jesus Himself, Himself, He said, Paul, that's how Paul says it to him. He said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. The Apostle Paul so believed that, that, that when actual robbers, thieves, would come to faith in Jesus, Paul understood their true Christian growth not just to be stop stealing, Work with honest work and production in order to get food and clothing and shelter. He, that's not how he saw sanctification for them. He said, yes, that. Now, once that's taken care of, the reason you work is to have extra money in order to give it to others. Quote, Ephesians 4, 28. Let the thief... No longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And that's how Paul himself lived his three years in Ephesus, verse 35. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember, remember, have memorized the words of the Lord Jesus. How he himself said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Giving, he argues, is more fulfilling, more freeing, more happy making. That's, a, that's the core of the word blessed here. More happy making than it is, even is of receiving. Why? In order to give, in order to meet the needs of those in need. In order to give, to keep the most important commodity in all of earthly existence. The gospel. To keep it alive in missions and in local churches. To help that, that family that God put in your life. Who, who really needs help financially. He says this giving. This giving is the ongoing protection against the deadly sin of covetousness and greed. This is why the, the systematic, ongoing giving of money on the biblical principle of the tithe is a built-in starting ground and an ongoing protection against greed. When that is treated 
as the first fruits biblical principle off the top, then it doesn't even come into play with the grocery bill and the electric bill and the mortgage and all of the new car and the Disneyland and the expensive clothing and how many vacations. It just is the constant, ongoing acknowledgement of worship. Lord, Everything I have, any smarts I have to do my job or any physical ability I have to do this labor, you could take away in a second. You are sovereign. You are you're, you're everything. I really believe that. And thus I will constantly go on demonstrating my trust that you have. I will not allow money to be my God. But you are God. Oh, that's why it's such a beautiful, joyous thing. The systematic. God is God. And then, oh, we could still, we could still be there having that, that principle practiced constantly in our lives. And thus, thus, so if we then continue to feel, man, greed is still getting a hold of my heart, we should look where we have some frivolous spending. And I'm just, again, this is a person. Is greed still there? And then find that money and go give that to that missionary. Go help pay, pay that rent for that family or that hurting neighbor or the Lord's work. The point is that giving is not a matter of wealth. It is a matter of principle. It's a matter of values. See, every one of us, I hope, thinks this. I think we do in here. More and more, sadly, in our world, it, people are raising kids and they don't think this. But there are principles, there are values. In other words, there are things in life that are so good, so healthy, that we ought to incorporate them into our lives. And good parents do that. With their children. Johnny. Say please. I mean I don't feel like saying please. I didn't ask you. If you felt like saying please. I'm training you. What is right. That other human being. Besides you little Johnny. Is also made in God's image. Say, please. Say, they gave you, what do you say? No, you say, thank you. You're acknowledging. You're not superior to them. They are made in God's image also. They did you a good. You say, thank you. Oh, you hold the door open for the person who's four feet behind you walking into the bank. We train our children in these things. Brush your teeth. I don't want to brush your teeth because we love them. We care about them. Okay. Now, I, this is, I am not saying this is how people have to. I'm just telling you how my wife and I have always done this value. Kids, we're Christians, your mom and dad. We raise you in the ways of the Lord. And we raise you with the foundation that God is God. He owns everything. You, in one sense, own nothing, not even that toy. You're a steward of it. And therefore in this house your mom and dad will model before you and we will train you as you're growing up to model you give to your creator off the top. Pause. One reason we have decided to do that. Do, can you imagine? I, I have actually have relations in the family that what I just gave about please and thank you, they didn't raise their children. 
to the extent they do it, they're very fortunate. But when you don't raise your kids in what's good, then they become 18 and it's like they got in such bad patterns. It's like, what? I got to say thank you? I got to do that. And they become ingrates. We train them in what's proper. That's why we say, so, oh, but they don't have a job when they're seven. That's why we say, oh, here's the way to practice it then. That's why when grandma gives you $50, you take five and you don't spend it on. God is God. You give it. You give it. And when you get a job at 16 or 29, <laughs> after the basement living, you, you get a paycheck and it's, you just know, yes, work in me and you joyfully give. That's how we have done it. Because we believe the words of the Lord Jesus. We want our kids to be happy. It is more happy making to give. And to receive. And when those two come together and Jesus finally saves them, then it's really awesome. Givers are blessed because they're freed from the destructive sin of greed in their constant giving. And then they're also blessed because as I began in the giving they are being conformed in that way to the image of the Lord Jesus. Just think about the way Paul decided to phrase this to these men. Remember. Okay. Okay. Here's that's his action. There's his command. There's the imperative. This is what he tells them to do. Commit to memory. The words of the Lord Jesus. And then he could have just given them. But then he said, no, no, that Jesus himself, as he walked the earth, ask Peter, Jesus himself said, now there's a reason, we're going to get there in a minute. There's no one who is a greater giver than Jesus. He himself said to us, guys, it's never done that thing. Blessed to give than it is to receive. Now, this Jesus saying is not found in the four Gospels. Like many, many Jesus authentic sayings are not found in the four Gospels. But there were so many Jesus sayings and teachings and parables that these guys, the early church, knew because of the oral traditions. And this particular one was really well known. That's why Paul just appeals to it. They all know what he's talking about. But there are other teachings of Jesus that are in our four Gospels that are right in line with Jesus' understanding of money and giving and greed. Just a couple. In Luke 10, 15, Jesus says, Take care. Okay, that's a word of caution, he says to them who are listening, be very careful and be on your guard against his, these pictures. There are enemies. Stand watch like a good Roman soldier. They may attack. You have an enemy, so be cautious. Be on your guard against all covetousness. Because one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. What's shocking? You know when he said that? It's when that 
that dude came running up to him and said, Jesus, tell my brother to give me my portion of the inheritance because mom and dad are dead. And Jesus didn't go after his brother. He lovingly went after him. Do not let this desire become a God to you. Watch out for this covetousness. So what if you never see a cent? Is that going to drive your life? That, that's the context. And that's what leads Jesus then to go on and tell the parable of the man who earned and earned and earned and you can only spend so much, so I'm going to build bigger barns and I'm going to store all my money, my goods, my stuff. And then in the parable, Jesus said, God said to him, Fool! This very night, you're going to die and stand before God. Your soul is required of you this very night. And the things you have prepared Whose will they be? He ends the parable and then Jesus looks at the crowd and he says to them, So is it, or so is the person who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward. And we all know the famous saying of Jesus from Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Why, Jesus? He answers it. Because where your money is, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We store up treasures in heaven by investing in God's kingdom down here. As we approach Christmas over these next two weeks, that's what Christmas is demonstrating. It is the great giver. Giving more than anyone has ever given. The greatest gift. And it is that gift himself. Giving. The eternal Son of God left the splendor of glory and became human being in the finite limitations of his humanity. He was born to a poor family in an animal stable. And he came to give his all. To lay down his life in a bloody, torturous death as a sacrifice for the sins of his people. Now, I did that on purpose because this is not Joe. I want you to see how now Paul takes essentially that and applies it to giving of money. This is why Paul could write to the Corinthians in the context of encouraging them to, to bring to completion 
their financial giving for the offering to the church in Jerusalem. And he says these words to them in 2 Corinthians 8. Starting with verse 8. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others. Okay, remember, he used other churches and Christians who said, Paul, we beg you, let us give more. And Paul called it the grace of God in them. So he put them forward, the, the Macedonians, as, as an, an example. But Paul, when he says, not as a command, what he means is, you, and this is the context where Paul will say it, and it is absolutely true. None of us should ever give if we don't want to. But if you call yourself a Christian and don't want to, pray, just like we have to do with all of our sin. Help my heart! Because God loves a cheerful giver. That's what I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness in the giving of the other Christians, that your love, now watch this, Paul says love is connected to this. Is it genuine or is it fake? That your love is also genuine. And then the next thing he says is this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet, for your sake, he became poor. So that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Paul used that. No one ever had so much. And no one ever gave so much as our Lord Jesus and so no wonder the Apostle Paul says to all regenerated people who are being conformed to Jesus' image, commit to memory the words of the Lord Jesus. That, that He Himself, as He walked amongst us, said, it is more blessed for you to give than it is to receive. Paul was so convinced that Jesus wasn't lying. He was so convinced of the joy of giving. He was so convinced of the danger of greed that he wrote to us American Christians, the richest society in human history. These words. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but to set their hopes on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good. They are to be rich in good works. They are to be generous. They are to be ready to share. And thus, storing up, he knows Jesus' words of treasure in heaven. And thus, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Where your treasure is, that's where 
your heart will be also. So let's, let's go on loving our Lord Jesus, seeking to be blessed in joy and in freedom. Let us go on obeying the command of the Lord Jesus as it comes through the mouth of the Apostle Paul. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus. He himself said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you that you have created the universe. You have created all things. Human history has worked out exactly as you wanted. Monetary systems have, have been set in different times and different places and in differing ways. And it is all set, Jesus, for you who talk so much about our money because it's so directly tied in conflict with our heart's dependence upon you or things. We thank you. We thank you that for the joy that was set before you of grabbing the likes of sinful us, you endured the cross. You gave your all. You despised the shame. For you looked to the future. And you, you through the scripture, through the word of God, have told us we are aliens and strangers down here and that we look to and long for not what is found in this world. But that which is found the life to come, the inheritance that is laid up for us in heaven, reserved and preserved for us. Oh, let us not waste our life. Let us, with money and time, treasure and talents and gifts, follow you and know the experience of the joy of giving and giving and giving and giving to the glory of your holy name. Amen and amen.